In this video, I'm going to talk about the matrix representation of factor analysis models. So in the last video, we talked about how we could write our system of equations where each individual equation represented a particular observed characteristic. We spoke about how the fact that we could actually stack these equations on top of each other, whereby we could write our system of equations or our system of dependent variables y is equal to some matrix, which I'm going to call capital lambda, times our vector of our unobserved factors eta, plus our vector of, in this case, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. But we spoke about some of the problems with this. The problems with this particular representation of factor analysis models is that implicitly each component in, in this case, our left-hand side variable, as well as the components of eta, actually are implicitly vectors and there are they are implicitly n by 1 vectors because we've got n observations and we spoke about some of the problems with this vector equation form of writing down factor analysis models the main problem being that each component of our dependent variable here really represents a vector of dependent variables because we spoke about for the case of y1 here Essentially what y1 is here is it's a vector of each observation for each individual. So we have a value of y1 for the first individual all the way through to the value of y1 for the nth individual. And we've kind of implicitly forgotten about the fact that y1 through y4, as well as some of the other terms in our model, really represent vectors. So what we'd like is we'd like a way of writing down our model which allows us to keep that information. So the way in which we can do that as a start is we could just add an index to each of our variables. So we can add an index i, so we've got yi1 is equal to lambda11 one one times eta i1 plus lambda12 times eta i2 plus epsilon i1. And the idea here is that i takes on the values 1, 2, all the way through to n. And we can do that for each of our equations in our system. So we have yi4 is equal to lambda41 times eta i1 plus lambda42 times eta i2 plus epsilon i2. So when you see the equation written in this form, it becomes quite apparent that we could actually write down the entire equation or the system of equations using solely indices. And it's important to note here that essentially because we've introduced this index i, we're talking about 4n observations on our left-hand side here. So what we can do is we can write down our equation as yij is equal to, in this case, lambda j1 times eta i1 plus lambda j2 times eta i2 plus epsilon ij. And implicitly here we're saying that i takes on the values of 1 through n, and j here represents which observable we're talking about. So it takes on the values 1, 2, 3, or 4. So essentially what we've done here is we have condensed down our system of 4n equations into a single equation which solely uses indices. But note that it's quite messy here, and it would be great to get some intuition to what actually is going on. So because y here has two indices, it has the index i and the index j, we quite naturally might like to think about y as being represented by a matrix. So what we can do is we can write down y as, in this case, a matrix of our dependent variable. The first component in the matrix is going to be y11, where the first one here indicates that we're talking about the first individual. And the idea is that each individual row represents that individual's variables which we actually observe. So we have y11 all the way through to y14. So y11 here represents for the first individual that particular value of observed characteristic 1 and y14 represents the value of that observed characteristic, in this case the fourth, for the first individual. And the idea is that we can write down n such rows because we've got n individuals in our sample whereby the last row is yn1 all the way through to yn4 as the last entrance. So the idea is that essentially we can extrapolate what all the other 
components of this matrix will be in between. And it's important to note the dimensionality of this matrix, essentially because it's n rows by the number of observed characteristics, in which in this case is 4, our matrix has dimensions n by 4. And we can write that this is equal to a matrix now of the particular factor scores for different individuals times another matrix which is going to represent the factor weights. So first of all, let's write down the matrix for the factor scores. Essentially what this is going to have is it's going to have the value of eta for the first person for the first unobserved variable, so 1, and then it's only going to have two, another value in the first row which is going to be eta 1, 2. And so each individual row, which corresponds to each individual, actually only has two entries because of the fact that we're talking about each individual having two scores for each of the different unobserved factors. So the idea is that we could extrapolate down. Hence, in the last row, we would have eta n1 and eta n2 as the last entrance. So just to be concrete here, because we're talking about n rows, this matrix has, has actually dimensions n by 2. And the idea is that we have to then multiply this matrix by a matrix which actually has the specific factor weights. And because we have two unobserved factors and we have four observed characteristics, this matrix is going to have dimensions n by 4. And notice then that when I multiply this by an n by 2 matrix, I get out an n by 4 matrix because the two inner dimensions cancel which is the same as our dependent variable. So that seems to make sense. So here each of the rows represent the weights for each of the four observed characteristics from each of the individual factors. So the first row here is the weights on the first unobserved factor, eta 1. So the first component is lambda 1 1 and then we continue through to the last component which is lambda 4 1. And then the second row and last row is just those similar weightings, but now talking about the second factor. So the first component is lambda 1, 2, and the last component here is lambda 4, 2. And then finally, as we might expect, we have a matrix of our disturbance terms, which is obviously going to be the same dimension as our dependent variable in order for the system to make sense. So then we just have epsilon 1, 1, through to epsilon 1, 4, which here again each individual row corresponds to the disturbances for one individual. And then the last row here is just going to be epsilon n1 through to epsilon n4, with all the values in between sort of being extrapolated for in a sort of sensible manner. So what have we done here? Essentially what we've done is we have included the information that we're actually dealing with n individuals which has allowed us to write our system as a single matrix equation. So how might we actually write that matrix equation? So the sort of normal way of doing it is by writing a tilde to indicate the fact that we're actually talking about a matrix. And actually implicitly, often in factor analysis, it's prudent actually to contain the dimensions of that matrix. So our dependent variable y actually has dimensions n, and in general, we're going to be talking about v observed characteristics. So overall, y has dimensions nv, which is going to be equal to a matrix of our factor scores, which is going to have dimensions n by the number of factors, which I'm going to indicate by a lowercase f. And we're going to indicate the weighting matrix by p. And actually, what we're going to say is that this matrix here is actually the transpose of our weighting matrix and when we take the transpose, it actually has dimensions f by v. And then finally, what we have is we have our disturbance term, which, if I write above, is going to have dimensions of the same sort as the dependent variable, which is going to be n by v. In this course on factor analysis, I'm going to alternate between the matrix representation of factor analysis and the vector representation of factor analysis models. And in some cases, it's going to be prudent to use the former and in others, the latter. But what I will say is that the matrix representation of factor analysis models is in some way slightly more powerful than the vector equation form of factor analysis models.